Lifestyle Pirates with Big J and Adriano. Awesome. Mate, welcome along. We've got Nicholas Hooper here from Mad and Associates. Very good morning to you, mate. Morning, gents. How are you? Very well. Fantastic. Very well. Um, Save my bush. Talk to me about that before we get stuck (laughs) into things. Save my bush. (laughs) (laughs) Nice way to open. Well, well, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) So um, uh, Save My Bush was a a project that we worked with um, actually across our offices. So we've got offices uh, in watch distribution in Sydney, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, and recently we've opened a European office in France and Spain based in Switzerland. Mm-hmm. For tax reasons, yep. But anyway, that's a big plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're everywhere, basically. Um, and of course, when the when the bushfires came roaring through, you know, most of the country, mm. um, Dan Nidera, who's the owner of Seven Friday, mm. super philanthropic. He just he loves to do projects where you give back to the community that supports you because mm-hmm. that's what we're all. That's really what all the brands are about. Yeah. And they came up with this idea that we were you know, do this um, this special cap and, you know, auction it for charity. Mm. Um, and then unfortunately our friend COVID came through yeah. and um, Changed everything. kind of put the, the kibosh on that. Mm. So we have actually taken delivery of them, which yeah. is great. So there's 100 caps Yep. and we will be uh, auctioning them while, you know, um, selling them off for, uh, for charity mm-hmm. for um, sort of South Coast wires. Yep. Um, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll When does that happen? How do we... TBC. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, just yeah. got to work out the logistics on it. Mm-hmm. And and for those that are listening, there's actually only 97 left because <laughs> we've each got one and uh, Nick's wearing one as well. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Seven Friday because that's one of the main brands that you you kind of represent and, and sell over here. You've even got the tattoo on your arm, which, I mean, if ever you want a commitment to a brand, that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, walk me through what Seven Friday is. How did it come about? What's the journey on that? So – Seven Friday is one of the brands that we've had within the company pretty much for the whole time we've been a company. Mm-hmm. Um, so we launched Mad and Associates. I say we, my business partner in Hong Kong, who mm-hmm. has a very similar business there. Mm-hmm. Um, we launched that we, when we launched um, Mad and Associates in Australia. Seven Friday was one of the original brands that joined us after, you know, three or four months. Um, I was always, you know, I'm a, I'm a watch guy. Mm-hmm. I've been a watch guy for almost 20 years now, mm-hmm. which is a fair portion of my life. And uh, and we all used to, you know, all, all of the now Seven Friday guys, we all used to work together building other bigger brands. Um, you know, most we sort of, I mean, you know, most notably we were uh, in Australia, uh, were running Breitling, mm-hmm. Maurice Lacroix, um, you know, back in the day uh, before Audemars Piquet went to Richemont, um, you know, Desco, the, brand, the company here that I used to work for, was the distributor for Audemars Piquet, Longines before it was Swatch Group. So we're all sort of been in the industry for quite some time. Yeah. And and Dan went out on his own. He bought a little sta- a little uh, design company in Switzerland called Studio Divine mm-hmm. and just basically came up with this design and went, here it is. Yeah. It's square. It's, it's, it's kind of funny looking. Yeah. Um, but I think the ethos of the brand was a fa- really about the community yeah. I think Seven Friday was really one of the first brands and not being biased, but it was one of those first brands that were really launched on social media. Yeah. And social media at, at this stage, you know, we're talking seven years ago because yeah. the brand's now seven years. Mm-hmm. So at, at that stage it was really about really about sharing lifestyle and community, which is, you know, kind of similar to what lifestyle pirates do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't driven by, you know, it's just, it wasn't driven by the algorithms. So it was really about the community. Mm-hmm. So I followed them for a, a couple of months, jumped on board, um, started working with Dan to bring the brand into the country and uh, and it just exploded from there. You're right. Nice. Nice. So where does the name come from? So one thing about the industry, the watch industry, um, and I, I think a lot of industries, you know, there's a lot of politics, but mm-hmm. the watch industry, especially in Switzerland, is very much – I think any industry in Switzerland, it's very much nine to five, Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. And Friday is the best day of the week because that's when you throw your work down, Mm -hmm. you go down to the beer hall, you have a schnitzel and you have a beer with your mates. Sounds good. What a life. Mm. Perfect, right? (laughs) Why not make it seven times that? Yeah. So Dan, 
he, when Dan originally came up with the concept for the brand, he didn't really want to give it a kind of fake, you know, a, f- a fake name with uh, which kind of feigned a bit of history. Mm. There's a lot of brands out there that lean on branding mm. to really tell kind of background, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and he essentially just wanted something to stick in the mind and he really wanted to communicate what the brand was about and the ethos of the brand mm. through that, mm. you know, Seven Friday. Yeah. And why Seven Friday? Because you can have seven Fridays in one week. Yeah. And that's what it was. Yeah. And that that relaxed attitude, that ethos is right from the top down, mm. yeah. right from Dan through the divine, straight through, um, you know, all of the distribution partners, right down to the retailers mm. and finally to the end consumer. Mm. Yeah, right. It makes perfect sense. I wish I could have seven Fridays. So. Why not? <laughs> I yeah. get it. I really do. So one thing, one thing I actually, I love about the watches is the bizarre design. So what's sort of like behind the design philosophy? It's very industrial. It's very, it's very different. Yeah, we've all, always had from the very beginning mm-hmm. a strong industrial theme to the brand, mm-hmm. and it, and it still transcends the brand to yeah. this day. I, I think. We're very much a, a lifestyle and a design brand. It was always about being able to give something that is a high perceived uh, complication, high perceived value, mm. at a reasonable price. Because there's, you know, um, there's one thing that I personally, and I think a lot of people don't quite uh, don't quite gel with, is this over the top exuberant luxury and luxury price tags and. Um, I know that's a little bit different in some industries, but um, but certainly in the watch industry, there was this this drive to do you know sapphire c- um, cases at a yeah. million dollars, and yeah, it's a million dollars. It's man. obnoxious, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just ridiculous. What can you do with a million dollars? You know, and not just for buying you know say property, maybe not in Sydney, but <laughs> just just to uh, I don't know, just to do good with that money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so that was why I think that was certainly one of the the initial. Um, you know, reasons behind the pricing and, and everything that, that we did. But it was it was to show that you could have something really interesting, something really cool. It was a bit of a conversation piece, but it didn't cost a fortune mm-hmm. because everyone should be able to enjoy the watch industry. That's, yeah. you know, we, we buy watches because they're special to us. They mark a special occasion. Uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons to. It doesn't mm-hmm. need to be just because we're going to flip them and make money. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and that's, that's kind of the part of the industry that it, just shits me to tears. Yeah. Mm. Can I say shit? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Good. Say whatever you explicit want. warning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can check the box. It's fine. <laughs> and, and so you've obviously been in the game a, a while. Have you seen much much of that change in terms of has, has there always been that kind of buy to sell? I mean, so f- for me personally, you know, watches tell a story. It's normally an, an, an achievement or it's a kind of family legacy or you know, there's an occasion attached to it. Has there always been this – it's kind of buy to hold, then flip, you know, or is, or is that fairly new with a, basically, a, you know, supply and demand issues? I think it's uh, it's always been there, but it's prevalent at the moment, especially in the mm. past two to three years. You know, the the rise and rise of the flipper. Mm. Um, I, I know people that just do that for a living. Yes, yeah. is their job. Yeah, really. Well, yeah. automotive industry is the same. Yeah, mm. at, at certainly at that end, and we're talking, you know, you know, there's the big you know, the big three, the big five kind yeah. of brands that you always see them flipping and increasing. Yeah. But I, th- I think it's the lovely thing about COVID and there's a lot of lovely things about COVID. And I agree. Yeah. And <laughs> it, I think it, Um, this is the great equaliser. Mm. I think that, you know, we're seeing that these flippers are now having to drop their prices. Yeah. So it's not as lucrative. So it's a little bit of an equaliser. Mm. Um, there, look, there's a lot of great things that are coming out of this. There's also a lot of really shit things. But yeah, there is. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Fair play. And so how how's it been for you out of interest? Uh, it, look, it's a discretionary purchase. Mm. So we have certainly seen it tighten up globally, mm. of course, because we've got all the offices. We are seeing it come back mm. um, quite strong in China now, mm-hmm. which is um, you know, a, a big part of the business. Mm-hmm. I think collectively across our offices, we do about 60% of Seven Fridays' entire business now. So when we see it, uh, start to bounce back in China. We know that everything is going to come back mm-hmm. through Hong Kong and then Australia and then France and Spain. Yeah. Um, some of the other brands that we do, not as I guess, not as quick to come back. Yeah. Okay. But I, I think it's going to. Personally, I think it's probably going to run for maybe six to twelve months. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the the recovery is going to be long 
and slow <laughs> and a little bit painful. Hmm. And I guess there's the bit as well with Australia, uh, with you know, Australia and New Zealand kind of coming through Touchwood sooner rather than everybody else. What's that going to look like? You know, obviously the international travel, but then other people in other parts of the world, how are they going to go? When are they? When's normality going to hit for them? You know, we were talking earlier, like my um, with my family being in the UK, they're going to see, they're going to start to see pictures of 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 us out and about, you know, over the next few months, exactly, uh, or even weeks now, you know, in terms of the first of June. But what does what does that look like for them? Where they're like, well, they're still at home, yeah. And then there's a is 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 animosity going to creep in? Like, what does that start to, you know? Are they going to be in FOMO? <laughs> Are we going to have more family arguments over Zoom? I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. So um, with the Seven Friday brand, you've obviously um, you've done some collabs, some projects. There was one with uh, the kind of graffiti artists. You're very much bringing fluoro back into the world, which I like. Um, how do you guys um, decide on who you work with? Um, you know, do you get much input into the design or do the, do, the, do the collabs get much input into the design? Like I see you've got a space series coming out. You did one with a graffiti artist. How does that all work? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think everything that we end up doing together, you know, whether it's local or a global stage, it's always about passion. Mm. And if the guys are passionate about what they do, mm. then we just gel. You know, um, obviously working with someone like Rocket Boys, which is the, you know, the fluoro, yeah. this is the second collaboration we did with him. And Rocket Boys is just, he's just hell passionate about what he does. Mm. Like if you follow any of his uh, social, um, you know, social channels, yeah. he's just, he's just a typical artist. Yeah. Yeah. So working with people like that is always what the brand likes to do. Uh, and, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be famous. Mm. Like it doesn't, we don't, we're not looking for likes. We're not looking for, you know, um, you know. Just like minded people. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And, but that's, I think that's what it's all about, isn't it? Definitely. You know? And that and that ethos again is what the brand is about. It it just flows right through it. And if you can if you can do something that you're passionate about and you can do something that you enjoy and it's not fake, mm. like it's not there for money or fame or anything else involved, then it just makes it so much more enjoyable. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. So how did you get into the watch industry? I was actually uh, a veterinary nurse trained. And, okay. um, and I was in hospitality and I was doing business management in hospitality mm. and doing a bit of a side job working in, um, in, you know, basically in retail watches. Mm -hmm. And I think it just, it just clicked. Yeah. I just, it just worked. I just enjoyed it. I like the finer details. I like the, the mechanics of it, all the quartz, you know, I, mm. I don't care if it's a battery yeah. mm. that doesn't, you know, but even, you know, even then, you know, there's mechanics behind that. Yeah, of course there is. You know, it's. It's, uh, it's just something that clicked with me. Mm. And then, again, it's if you're passionate about something, it's going to just flow and ebb for you and you're going to end up where you need to be. Mm. And I think, I, you know, I think that's where I've just kind of fallen into yep. because I was going hospitality management and it sucked. Mm. <laughs> it was, I can pour a beer, okay, yeah. I can run a cafe. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Right, where else do you go? Yeah. So it was, um, I, just, I just fell into it and then roles became available to me because I enjoyed it. You know, mm. I, I, I worked in retail for a, a quite a while. Um, I worked with a company called, well, actually I was working with um, Sunglass Hut mm -hmm. originally. Yeah. And then I started working with Wallace Bishop uh, in, uh, in Queensland mm -hmm. where I, where I just, I just immersed myself in watches. And like anyone who's passionate about the watch industry, where you start working in retail, you always want to move on to that next stage. And mm. that's, you know, repping a brand or, you know, wherever you end up. Um, from Wallace Bishop, I came down here and I, um, it was actually, I think it was, I actually came down for the big day out. I was, I was living in Queensland. I came down for the big day out, um, and it was fantastic, mm -hmm. but I also came down and had a, um, uh, an interview with Angus and Coote and Angus and Coote at that stage was this massive store underneath center point, you know, in Sydney. And, um, and we had, you know, I think we were three levels, um, 30 odd staff and we had brands at that stage running from their, our own home brand right up to at, we had Amiga um, and that, especially for the Australian market, Amiga was, you know, that was like the bee's knees. Yeah. Um, and I came down and had an had a interview with these guys and, and then I was here. 
Mm. And I said, yep, perfect. Working working with all these amazing brands, started to bring brands that I already already worked with in a retail sense into that store, which was a lot of fun. The little brand called Maurice Lacroix, which I have a like I have an absolute love for. Um, it was where I cut my teeth in wholesale. So I left mm. I left uh, Angus and Coote in retail after 364 days, didn't quite make it to the year and started working in wholesale and started working with Maurice Lacroix. And that was, it. that was my, I think it was probably, it was a turning point for me because I, I was really super passionate about this brand and it's, it's a nice little brand. It's not an amazing, you know, it's never going to change the world. And I fell in my dream job. Yeah. Right, and and that's where it began. Mm-hmm. So from Maurice Lacroix, I was there for you know four four and a half years. Then moved on to Brightling, and then I think it was that whole. I think it's the corporate, you know, the corporate world where mm-hmm. you've always got someone above you that's making that decision to yeah. to sort of you know whatever they're doing. It's whether it's ego or you know spreadsheets. Yeah. And um, I had the opportunity to uh, to bring a you know start my own company and and start bringing my own brands in. Mm-hmm. And that's it, 2013. Yeah. Well, okay. Nice. Yeah. And so how did you come up with Mad and Associates? So Mad and Associates is a – it is actually a um, a company that was opened in uh, now 12 years ago in Hong Kong okay. by my – it was my boss's boss here right. in Australia, mm-hmm. um, Denny Martinet. And Denny has been in the industry for – forever, you know, it actually came out of hospitality, interestingly enough, out of hospitality, um, you know, managing places like Banyan Tree, like those sort of larger um, scale mm-hmm. operations um, into the watch industry. And I think he came to this same realisation at the end of, a, you know, a long career working for other brands um, and there were some mergers and some other things. He, uh, he opened the company Mad and Associates in Hong Kong and then purely through, I guess, Working together all those years, uh, we saw an opportunity to bring it here, and and it was always about mad about luxury, yeah, because we are mad about luxury, mm. but we are mad about watches. Like yeah. it, watches really were where we landed, uh, and that's you know the the sort of the crux of what we do mm. now. Very cool, very cool. And so, what keeps you um, in in the watch industry? Because you you have a shop in um, at the cannery, um, a lot of whiskey, very kind of. Luxury, almost, almost like almost like a man cave. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. um, like, what what is is that? What kind of keeps you in? Because you can make your own decisions and uh, you know do your own thing. Or what kind of keeps you in the game? I think it's the connection with the brands. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, having my own company and distributing something that I really love. Yeah. Is always going to keep you interested. Yeah. You know, it's that you never work a day in your life. When yeah. you love what you do, mm-hmm. Seven Friday, right? It is. Yeah, okay. It's certainly one of the things. So, um, I think having that connection with a brand, and because of the brands that we work with, uh, you know, we got some startup brands. We got brands that have been around for you know a little bit more established, sort of the 10, 20 year mark. Mm-hmm. Um, but we deal with we deal with brand owners and CEOs. Maybe not even CEOs. You know, it's it's brand owners and and designers that you have a connection with, and I think it's more of a collaborative sort of process because you you all want to, you know, you all want to be successful at what you do. Mm. And having that connection and that personal connection with them really wants, I guess, really kind of motivates you mm. to um, to both do well. So probably not so much about, you know, you know, ha- you know having your own space and, you know, just doing your own thing. Mm. Do it because we, we love to work together. I think that's really what it is. Yeah. So the tours and stuff that happen with Seven Friday and collaborations that have been going on overseas and stuff, what are they about? Like it seems really cool getting on an Airstream and just going around and like-minded people and watches and drinks and it's, mate, it sounds fantastic. You're looking for a job? Yeah, really. <laughs> that, that, that was my next, uh, next question actually. <laughs> well, actually, we're, we're just actually we're just talking about the Airstream. We're actually we're trying to get it down here mm. to do a bit of a, a tour. But I don't think Dan and most people in Europe don't realise – how big Australia is. Yeah. So they'll do a tour of Europe and it'll take them a few days. Yeah. You know, take us a few days to drive the Airstream up to Brisbane. Yeah, so, that's valid. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, certainly not as fun as stopping in Paris with the Airstream or like uh, stopping on the <laughs> – when, uh, when the Airstream got over to um, over to London, it actually broke down on the um, 
on the London Gate Bridge oh, and, and ruined me. traffic for like for the whole day. Um, so Priceless it was, PR. Oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> it, um, yeah, I don't know about good or bad, but hey, <laughs> still pretty funny. Yeah. Um, Look, I think the the tours are they're a celebration. Yeah, yeah, they really are a celebration, and and the tours are different wherever we go. Mm-hmm. So whether it's with the Airstream or whether it's uh, whether it's with motorbikes or whether it's with Bull Rush Rally, mm-hmm. you know, the collaborations, we have a little bit of freedom to do exactly what we want to do yeah. in in our particular region. So obviously, you know, motorbikes and uh, and everything that I like are not going to be the same as what all the guys in China like. So yeah, it's well, a little bit different in that respect. I'm in for motorbikes. So yeah, carry. motorbikes, yeah. supercars, whiskey, yeah. watches. <laughs> Is there a ring on that finger? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got man crush going on. There. Do you want me to step out? Yeah, one of my favourite things really. Yeah. Aren't they? But like, I think they're the same for most guys yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. So again, why not do what you really love? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that like the tour is a, you know, have you got an idea? Let's let's do one, right? The tour is really are just a bit of a celebration of the Seven Friday lifestyle, mm. and it's it's stuff that is living, you know, living Seven Friday. Yeah. Well, that's one of you know that's one of our our hashtags. It's it's live Seven Friday. Yeah. It's why not? Yeah, exactly. It's true. Um, one of the other brands you you carry as well is is Rec, uh, watches or REC. How, how do, is it Rec? Rec, yeah. REC, yeah, yeah, Rec. It's um, um yeah. Well, uh, t- tell us about that because I'm, I'm right in thinking they've got car parts in them. They do, they do, and it's again, it's because I fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. Again, it's not, it's not a brand that's going to change the world, but I met with the guys, um, two two young guys from Copenhagen, mm. and I met with them a few years ago in in uh, in Basel in Switzerland, where we all well we used to now it's defunct, mm-hmm. but um. They, it was, it was an odd kind mm. of, kind of Basel. Um, they had rented this tiny little apartment in the back streets of Basel. Uh, we had to go through an old barn door past a bunch of push bikes and a surfboard. I don't know why Sounds it's, like Melbourne. <laughs> it, yeah, it was more like Yugoslavia. Like it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was, a, it was odd. It yeah. was really odd. And up these tiny crooked little stairs up to this really strange little mezzanine kind of, mm-hmm. um, you know, slanty floor, um, you know, uh, apartment. And they had this whiskey mm-hmm. and watches and the watches are made from cars. Yeah, right. <laughs> and just gone tick, tick, tick. Oh, you make that out of minis. Awesome. Yeah. I've had seven minis in my life. I still drive a mini. Yeah. Sign me up. Yeah, it's an easy and connection. Yeah. Even from a, and I'm going to put my salesman hat on, like even from a retail point of view, as a as a consumer or as a um, as a retailer trying to sell the brand, you've instantly made a connection mm. with with the car or you know the historical piece that's in it. So whether it's cars or it's mm. you know um, Spitfire aircraft, you don't have to sell it. Mm-hmm. Mm. So you just go, well, here's a watch. Yeah. You're already connected to it. How many would you like? Yeah, exactly. That's but awesome. It, so what exactly is made out of out of the car? Is that like the panels, the backing or? Depending on the model. So yeah. um, I'm I think, very intrigued about that. Yeah. They, we've just actually launched one, um, which is a collaboration with um, RWB. Yeah. So, you know, RWB. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So for those who don't know, RWB is, uh, it it's, has to be the most famous underground Porsche customization yeah. in the world. Um, and I can't pronounce his name and I'm not even going to try. No, I wouldn't either. Um, Extremely wide body Porsches. Big wide body Porsches, uh, a little bit kind of like, a little bit like your Liberty Walk. Yeah. But this is the original. The original, yeah. The original. So, Raul um, Walt something. Yeah, yeah. Raul Walt Begriff. Yeah. Um, uh, so they come out of Japan mm. um, and he's an absolute master. Yeah. And we've just collaborated with him for his two original Stella Artois and Rotana, so the – black and gold, you yeah, know, the yeah. old JP livery mm. and the purple Porsche wide yeah, body. Yeah. He's donated parts of those two cars and they're actually in our watches. Stop it. Yeah, they nice. are so fucking cool. Yeah. Wow. And they're available now? <laughs> so they've just, uh, we've just global launched, <laughs> um, but they're for pre-sale. So yeah. pre-order you can, you can jump yeah. this 305 pieces of each. Yeah. And once they're done, they're done. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the, the beauty of REC. So, Everything they do is completely unique. So we can have 50 watches side by side and everyone's going to have just that 
little bit of difference in the way the steel scratched or yeah. a little bit of extra patina. Yeah. So aside from the fact that we're always going to be limited by the amount of products we can sell mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. the donor cars can only give us X amount of material or the donor aircraft can only give us X amount of material, they're all going to be unique. So they're, they're all one-on-ones. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Kind of like that high-end ultra hypercar, you know, they're all made slightly different. They're all very sort of artisan and customised and that's such an amazing concept. So REC, R-E-C you said, so is it like REC as in a car REC? REC they, as in or record, reclaim, recycle. All right, nice. Yeah, yeah. So many meanings. It's deep, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's like an onion. Absolutely. <laughs> so what are the other models you have? So you mentioned Porsche, you mentioned a Spitfire. Yeah, so we've um, done uh, a 1945 Russian Spitfire. Wow. Yeah. And Did it actually fly in the wall? Yeah, so basically this Spitfire was, it was, um, of course, all Spitfires come from England. Mm. So it was on lend-lease from the uh, from the Air, Royal Air Force mm. to the Russians during World during the World War, mm. and it had done about eight hours total flying time, and it crashed in the Russian tundra during a dogfight. Mm-hmm. And this aircraft was then salvaged by a farmer, stuck in a shed. It's the it's the most intact aircraft like um, that has ever been salvaged, and has now completed restoration by a by a, an English aircraft res- restora- uh, restorer. Mm. Um, it's it's quite spectacular, and, mm. e- and every every single wreck watch. Um, so this one's called the RJM, which is named after the original uh, designer of the Spitfire. Mm. Every single wreck has this aluminium salvaged from the wings of the 1945 Spitfire. So it's uh, you know each each of them have these little battle scars on them. So mm. it all tells a story. Yeah, cool, very cool. Wow, a barn find as well. And it's a barn find, exactly. <laughs> Epic. And so you got so you, Spitfire, Porsche, you mentioned Mini. So Spitfire, Porsche, <laughs> um, we started with Minis. Mm. Um, brand's about five years old and yep. they, they kicked off with doing Minis. So basically they would use a little bit of the design cues from the Mini and same with the Porsche and, uh, and the Spitfire as well. Yeah. Um, and then they would take, you know, it would be – salvage steel from the bonnets or door liners and make them into the dials. So you'd see, you know, raw steel as mm. the uh, as the dials. They took that concept when they first launched onto um so these are these are the guys from uh from Copenhagen mm. onto Shark Tank. Well the Copenhagen yeah. version of that. And I don't can't pronounce that. So uh, so they <laughs> took it on Shark Tank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they took it on Shark Tank and got this uh, in, uh, and were quite successful and got some backing and then stepped it up into different models and different designs and and really really see the brand evolve from a very simple uh, I would even say generic case with mm. of course parts of minis inside mm. to a ground up design and when we say ground up design they've basically gone to a designer uh, in this case, Studio Divine. So you can start to see the connections with everything we kind of do kind of mm-hmm. centers around yep. them. But they take that take this idea to Studio Divine and, and they were able to produce the next collaboration or I guess the next donor car, which was a uh, Mustang. So we've got this whole series where the dial is made out of um, 1965s and 1966 Mustangs. But they took it to the next level. So we go from a quartz basic in the in the minis into a nine series automatic uh, Miyota movement, but it's all the de- the design cues from the vehicle, which are now incorporated into the case and everything that you see of the watch. So you can have a you know you look at it from the side and you can actually see there's a, like the sort of a the shape of the tail of a 1966 Mustang. Mm-hmm. You know the typography the the uh, the fuel gauge is is a power reserve, and it looks like the fuel gauge in a sixties Mustang. Yeah. So there's a lot of really really um, subtle, mm. I guess, subtle touches. Mm. Um, but they really show mm. where the where the cars come, you know, where who the donor car yeah. was from. But they even take it that one step further. So with REC, especially with the, the P51s and the 901, which is the, the Porsche, mm. which the original name of the, the first 911 was a 901, but turned out Peugeot not owned the 901 name, so they had to rename it. So we 
little bit of a homage to that. Mm. So the 901. Didn't, didn't know that. Yeah. No, I didn't know either. God. We'll write, that, write that down. Yeah. yeah. Better fact Citation. Check, fact check that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Citation <laughs> needed. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think they, they did. Porsche actually produced a couple of 901s. There were a few models at the very start that were actually named a 901. Um, but they, of course, very had to quickly change that to 911. Yeah. So each one of these donor vehicles with the rec watches in their more specialised series all have the VIN number from the individual car that the oh, materials nice come from. And then they have a video story that can link it back to the actual car. So with the with the first series of 901s, it was from a, um, a 1984 Porsche 911. They you only used the air cooled, so it was a, all the yeah. older models. Mm. Um, you know, we've worked with a 1976 uh, RS Turbo. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. Yeah, really nice, beautiful car. Mm. Um, pretty good watch too. Yeah. By the, um, and uh, it's all it's all linked back to the individual individual cars. Right. If you were to have a car of significance or something that you did want a watch made out of, uh, could you approach Rec? You could. Yeah. You could. Uh, I think they've just recently um, done a, a job, I guess more like a, a corporate kind of um, uh, project mm-hmm. with one of the large Japanese uh, car manufacturers uh, as a, you know, as a, corporate gifting yeah, kind yeah. of thing. So yeah, certainly there's there's room for that. Um, I'd love to see, you know, the opportunity to say you've got an old Porsche and you've been restoring it to actually take that piece to them yeah. and go, can you put this inside one of your watches for us? Yeah, that'd be that amazing. That would be a cool thing. Yeah. yeah. What would be really cool uh, is a Concord one. Tip, you know, nodding the hat to Concord. Another Suburb brick. I grew up in. Hey. <laughs> <Never mind. laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I think that'd be amazing. Yeah, if you've, you know. You've had the opportunity to go on it. It's obviously a massive part of history and I think that'd be amazing. There's a few brands. I'll, I'll let you take that one, mate. That's all right. It, <laughs> well, there's one of, the, one of the other brands that I you, that actually introduced to Australia had has actually done a, a Concorde um, uh, piece where there was, there's pieces of, of the Concorde inside the watch. Really? Yeah, yeah. Watch was always fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that was appalling. <laughs> <laughs> I like it though. Yeah. I like it. Um, you. What, what's your take on... Um, have you seen much of a, a a move away from the traditional kind of timepiece with the introduction of smartwatches? What, what's your take on those? I think traditional watches are always going to have their place. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I think smartwatch. Really, the only thing smartwatch has done to the industry was take away dollars. You know, because if if you're going to buy a watch for a significant occasion, mm. you're not going to buy a smartwatch. Mm-hmm. You're going to get a smartwatch thrown in with your data plan through <laughs> one of the telco providers. Yeah. So I I think what it did is actually introduce a lot of um, younger customers to the watch wearing industry mm. because you know I, I even look at my own watch wearing. I didn't start wearing watches until I was probably 25. What was mm-hmm. your first one? It was a Seiko. My dad bought me a Seiko. It was a blue dial. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the model numbers, but I'm pretty sure they still make it today. Yeah, nice. Yeah. What was yeah. your first watch? Casio, the calculator one with a remote where I could change the change the television change the during um, school. I had one of those. Um, That's I awesome. One. I love it. I still got it. Happy. <laughs> yeah, genuine does, 80s does one. Does it still work on the TV? It does. Nice. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you need like an old CRT TV. I had a, I had one of those. Do you remember? Pop, did you get pop swatches in Australia that you could just pop it out? Yep. No. Yeah, I never. That, that yeah, was mine. Yeah. yeah. That's Con- my first piece. Cool. Nice. <laughs> Still got it. Still wear it. <laughs> what are you wearing today, John? Uh, this brand is called Electricians. Um, actually, got this courtesy of you. Thank you, Squire. Um, and it, it lights up. It's very cool. You can't you can't see this if you're listening, but it lights up. It's very cool. I get a lot of comments actually on it because it's fluoro. It just stands out. Yeah, it's a nice watch. It's pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. And I think I think if if you can if you can really wear and pull something off that you enjoy. Mm then it just makes it worth it. Mm. Yeah. So what's the next big uh, sort of up-and-coming watch company? Or what do you sort of look in um, a company, a watch company sort of to bring them on as wholesale or to wholesale for them? I've got to tell a story. Yeah. Yeah, that really what it is. It, yeah. if, if they don't have a solid story, then it's so hard to work with. And I've made mistakes before where we've worked with brands that yeah. – and we're not just talking a marketing story. If they If they don't – 
if they don't have direction, if they, if, if they don't have that genuine, authentic reason for doing what they're doing, mm. then it's just going to be hard. Yeah. Yeah. I've worked with a few where they, you know, I guess the best intentions were there, mm-hmm. but um, just if they don't have a, a solid story, it just doesn't work for us, especially in the, in the realm that we work in. You have to connect on so many different levels. It's not just it's a Rolex. Yeah. Well, we know what Rolex is, so we're going to buy that because that's what we know. Mm. We've got to start from scratch. We've got mm. to tell a whole. We've got to create something from yeah. really from nothing. Mm-hmm. So it has to tell a, a compelling story. Yeah, I mean, you'd come across that in your world, right, in the automotive industry, especially with luxury cars. You know, people, because it's a it's not a discretionary spend. People are buying heritage they're buying a story they're buying it for a reason mm. you know we were speaking about whiskies and wines and stuff it's exactly the same yeah you buy it because there's a connection whether you know the maker whether it's been part of your family you know, there's there's more to yeah. it than just a we're going to go and just yeah that's what makes it so hard for startups mm. you know, especially in the automotive industry starting up now is it's almost impossible that's why i was wondering for watches you know are there a lot of startup companies and watches and coming, every day yeah I get an email every day from a new brand that wants to penetrate Australia. Yeah. And I say penetrate, that just yeah. sounds, that sounds <laughs> yeah. I think we just went to a different level, didn't yeah. we? <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, right. so, so what stops you from letting them in to MAD? <laughs> like, what, what, that, geez, that went a different way as well. <laughs> so what stops you from going, okay, yeah, we'll give you a go? Uh, I think I need to like, I, I need to like what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and and I I think I found this over the probably over the course of the last few years that everything that I like working with sells to people that are very similar to myself. Mm. Right. So John and I have a lot of you know a lot of I think characteristics and uh, a lot of ideals that are similar. Mm. Um, and John, we met through a uh, through a, a golf game, mm. and John yeah. turns out John was wearing one of my watches, and I'd never met the guy. Yeah, right. So where was I going with that? I'm not sure. So it was um, if if that brand doesn't tick the box for me, yeah. then I'm going to have a hard time selling it, yeah. which means I'm going to have a hard time selling it to a retailer or a consumer. Yeah, of course. So I, I really just want to work with stuff that yeah. so, I like myself. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't sort of push a brand that I wouldn't – I don't have a connection with. Yeah. You know, it's got to mean something to me as well. Exactly. Because I'm going to fight for it. So, yeah. So who's the – Who's one to look out for at the moment? Who's doing different shit? <laughs> the industry's going through a, a little bit of a, mm. a, 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 a realignment. Mm-hmm. So a lot of brands are doing safe. Mm-hmm. That's what they're doing. They've been, they've been doing it for a few years now. The industry has had a pretty tough time over the probably three to five years, yep. depending on which sort of region you're in. Is that for the little guys or all of them? I think all of them, yep. you, know, you know, brands, we're talking big brands cutting production. You know, I, I think mo- the majority of the reason why you see stupid pricing for, um, you know, for grey market Rolexes and APs is because production's lower. Yeah. And this is, it's partly because of, you know, the whole supply and demand, you know, we want to control supply so the demand increases. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it is because there is less watches in there and this isn't this isn't a strategy a lot of it is purely because they're producing less because there are less customers yeah so when you can go safe it just it's easy here's a blue dial here's a green dial sell it to your consumers yeah yeah who's doing anything interesting it's a that's a tough question yeah yeah to be honest it's i, I honestly haven't seen anyone really do something crazy or even even noteworthy, um, tourbillons, yeah. complications, new materials, it's all kind of been done. Yeah. Yeah. What's it like in the automotive industry? Well, electrification's really changed a lot. So that's pretty much on the – it's going to take over re- very soon. So ICE, internal combustion engines are on the phase out. So at the moment now, people who are doing something very different is Tesla. Mm. So you heard Elon Musk recently say that, you know, his cars are going to be doing 1.8 to 100, you know, whereas the car of today or this super or hyper car of today is like 2.9, 3.5 is sort of the Goldilocks era or the Goldilocks sort of um, area to, to play in. But Elon Musk is talking about doing 1.8, you know, and he's 
In how a family it, car. Yeah, yeah. How, and how he's doing it, cold fusion thrusters. So in other words, obviously mechanical grip in terms of tyres to the ground, it can't get that sort of acceleration factor, so it has to use something else. So it's using air thrusters that charge up and and push out so it propels the car forward to get that sort of timing. So, yeah, who's doing something completely different? That mad mad. Yeah. <laughs> but it's amazing, yeah. But it's only going to – and supposedly that's the base model I heard. So I don't know what the other ones are. SpaceX, pretty much just buy a rocket. Bloody hell. Yeah. So, yeah, they're – I like I like people that just do things that are completely mental, yeah. But I suppose you really can find on a watch. You can't really do rockets and stuff, or can you? I don't know. Maybe there's – it's actually – there's a brand that's going to land with me in a couple of days, um, a brand called Sniper. Mm-hmm. And they – and we're just picking up sort of the last pieces of of, a, you know, of distribution in, in Asia. Mm-hmm. And they're very much a Richard Meal kind of um, – Maybe if Richard Mille and um, AP got together mm-hmm. and had a illegit- illegitimate son, it would be Sniper. And it's this, <laughs> this crazy um, crazy G-Shock-esque kind of brand with ridiculous pricing, but you could snap on um, like laser beams and and, uh, and cigar lighters on oh, the side no of them. Way. Like they're just – Like rail attachments on a gun. Yeah, exactly right. That's exactly. brilliant. Yeah. So that, and that's what the whole thing – so we've got a couple of those coming. Freaking lasers. <laughs> <laughs> What's the damage on those? Um, well, look, when they first came out, they were sort of sitting around the sort of fourteen to 15,000 and some, mm. some above, but we've got, you know, the last of our collections coming in from, from Hong Kong. Um, so they will be cheap. Yeah, okay. Cheap, cheap. Like I'm thinking, I'm going to keep one for myself yeah. because it's just it's just a crazy watch. Yeah. But you know who's no, but no one's doing anything interesting. Yeah. To, you know, in all honesty, and there's a lot of collaborations. You know, where brands are working with different partners, mm-hmm. whether it's working with jeans companies or you know, oh, I can't even think of anything else that is you know really groundbreaking. Yeah. Um. There's only so much you can do. So watch attachments. That's a something I've never thought I'd sort of go into, but say for this sniper sniper sort of watch, you can actually add like little sort of attachments to it. So you can, so the watch is modular, so you can add things as you go. That's, there's a few brands. That's a, that's a really cool idea. Well, yeah, it's, it's, especially it's, for it's, someone who plays video games. Not, but not me, not me. Asking for a friend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's been a few brands that have done successful attachments. Uh, uh, Linda Verdlin mm-hmm. is, re- is, I think they really nailed it. So they've got quite a, kind of um, industrial kind of skeletonized um, uh, top case mm-hmm. and you can snap on, the whole idea was to be able to snap on um, ski, you know, uh, like snow skiing instruments onto the watch and that was mainly because um, well, it's one, it's either Lind or Verdelin, I can't remember which mm-hmm. one, but because they're both mad skiers. Mm-hmm. So they just made something that they really liked. So there's a lot of brands that do it. Sniper did it with, um, with laser sights and uh, and cigar lighters, which again, yeah. kind of cigars, which we didn't talk about cigars. Yeah, yeah. So just add cigars that to the cool. list. Cahiba, Siglos, yeah. done. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I think there's a lot of brands that do attachments. We've done attachments for Seven Friday mm-hmm. as well. Um, so a lot of people were going, we love your Seven Friday, but they're only you know splash resistant. Um, we can't take them in the water. Can't take them. In doing anything that's going to, you know, endanger the watch. Mm-hmm. So we created what we called the HDB and the HDB is the heavy duty box. And it's, it's essentially, <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> save my bush. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, kind of like a GoPro case. Yeah, that's about exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's exactly what it is. Yeah. So we've got this sort of clear acetate, uh, actually tinted acetate. So we've got a couple of different colors just why not? Yeah, of course. Um, that it makes the watch 100 meters water resistant, and of course shock resistant because it's c- surrounded by this massive, mm. you know, acrylic case. That's cool. cool. Um, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. But again, it's crazy because it's it's fun, and yeah. I think it's it's one thing that Dan does very well. He thinks of basically something that he would like himself, yeah. and then makes it. Yeah. So hopefully we'll have sneakers soon. Um, we've got t-shirts, we've got jackets, we've got plenty of hats. Watches. Uh, so it's was, a real lifestyle brand. It's not just watches. It's exactly what it is. Live Seven Friday. There you go. Yeah. So sunglasses as well. Um, we do sort of industrial jewellery. It's very much, you know, what, whilst it started as a, a, a watch brand back in 2013, 12, 13, mm-hmm. it very quickly became 
very much a lifestyle. Yeah. Very much and not just product driven because we serve, because, you know, because we launched on social media and it really was about bringing together a community. Mm. It's the community that stuck the brand together yeah. and has really been the whole driving force behind the brand. So that's why we now, we don't do boutiques anymore. We used to, we started off doing seven Friday boutiques, but it's, uh, it's not something you can really open with 10 pieces. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, our ranges are small and we keep them nice and tight because we, we don't want to push 60, 70 pieces onto a retailer and have only 10 or 15 of those. You know, it's the whole 80, 20 rule. Mm-hmm. You do 80% of your business with 20% of your SKUs. We didn't want to do that. So our ranges are tight. Of course, the downside is that you can't open a boutique with that. Mm. And it's boring. Mm. You open a boot, you walk in and there's 10 watches on a wall and a stuffy salesperson behind a counter. So Dan did away with those. Mm-hmm. Now we open cafes yeah. and, you know, um, yeah, music bars and restaurants. With it. There's this amazing restaurant in KL. We've got one in Singapore. We've got spaces in Mexico. Um, we've got a few spaces in, in, two spaces in Taiwan, which is where I got this uh, yeah. tattoo yeah. after a, after a very heavy night. It looks pretty fresh, yeah. It does. Yeah, you yeah. Had that so, a while? No, no, that was um, mm, April. No, right, okay. Ju- okay, just before COVID started. Yeah. Okay. It was like a, a, a week later, they B- shut the world down. B- mm. Big night or? Oh, massive night. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but did, did you wake up and go, oh, or did you go, hey, that's pretty cool. <laughs> My watch is broken. <laughs> 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 the... Um, I know. So this was a decision I made with a massive hangover. Um, I've been talking about it for a long time and this will be part of a series of three. So for those of you that are listening, Nick actually has the Seven Friday tattoo, a watch face on his arm. So check out the YouTube channel because you'll be able to see it. So, um, yeah, we we had talked about it for a long time and I talked with Dan about it saying, you know, I really want to, I really want to have watches, right? This is, Whilst it, it looks like a Seven Friday logo mm. or a Seven Friday icon, it's actually not quite. Mm-hmm. So I did a couple of little changes to it so it isn't so obvious a Seven Friday, but like you, like you picked it that it is a Seven, it's a seven yeah. Friday base, right? Mm-hmm. So I wanted something that was influential in my life and that's watches. Mm. I'm just trying to figure out the other icons. Yeah. So whether it's going to be family, which of course are very influential, mm-hmm. yeah. or whiskey, yeah. which is also very influential. Wow. Motorbike? Motorbike, yeah, yeah. yeah. I jest with yeah. whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whiskey is what got me into this. Yeah, yeah. So um, after a, a massive, massive night for the opening of the uh, second boutique in, in uh, Taiwan, mm. in Kaohsiung, um, I mentioned that I wanted to get the tattoo and, and then the, the, uh, the owner of Seven Friday in Taiwan went, perfect, there's a great place around the corner. Yeah. And within 15 minutes I had, it had been sketched up and started. Brilliant. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So being the seventh year... I think you mentioned earlier of Seven Friday. Was there big hopes for this year and a big sort of branding launch or something? Not a launch, a big branding party, but COVID stuffed it all up. Being Seven, or was that just me? No, no, it was Seven. <laughs> was Seven was a you know, it was a big year. Yeah, it was. It was supposed to be a a. Um, it was a, still a, a big year. <laughs> uh, yeah, for the wrong reasons. Yeah. It, look, it was. I think it was a milestone. Mm-hmm. It was definitely a milestone because there are so many brands that launch and they have all the best intentions but they kind of just peter out yeah Yeah. exactly yeah so the fact that we could make it to seven years is testament to the design you know that the iconic the iconic square watch Mm -hmm. that's really who seven friday is Mm. and that's still to this day is our number one seller is the iconic square Mm. so i think it was it was important to celebrate this year um every year we get together and have the seven friday games um, this year was going to be in, um, P- in PP Islands. Oh, nice. So basically what we do, so we don't do, um, Seven Friday doesn't do uh, work meetings or conferences or anything like that. We don't do any sales meetings at Basel. We don't, you know, we really only kind of participate in Basel just because all of our friends are there. Yeah. So the last, the last Basel that we went to was Seven Friday. We had, um, uh, well, the last one I went to was uh, we did a, we basically did a pop-up Seven Friday space in the Tesla boutique in mm-hmm. Basel. Nice. I think last year or so, the last year that um, they went to Basel, they drove around in an old, um, it's called a Pinskauer, which is, I hope, I, sorry, Dan, if I didn't get that um, pronounced right, but it's an old um, army truck. Mm-hmm. And they drove around, picked up press and retailers and drove them around the Basel city <laughs> in the back of an army truck. Yeah. Just because. Yeah. Why not? So the Seven Friday games... 
we all from all over the world, all mm-hmm. the distributors, some um, some retailers, some press, some fans of the brand, anyone who wants to, mm. we all converge on one one uh, one place. Yeah, Seven Friday puts on all of the food and alcohol, and uh, and you know we make our own way there, mm. and then we just have almost like a Olympic Games, but a little bit more. Uh, my caliber kind of games, <laughs> All right? So, some some fairly basic activities like beer pong. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and and raft building, and um, I guess kind oh, of wow. to, to bring that yeah. that community together. Yeah. Mm. And it's not just your distributors. Like it's like I said, it's the press. It's any ambassadors. It can be people who just love the brand mm. are all invited to come. Um, and in you know that would have been a big year this year. Mm. Um, it's, it, but again, it's about fostering that community, mm. bringing everyone together and, and celebrating it. So, you, you know, the seventh year of Seven Friday, Seven Friday Games would have been massive. Yeah. But not this year. Yeah. Unless you do virtual, virtual Seven Friday Games. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do you play pit beer pong virtually? Yeah, interesting. Um, you said something earlier on, you were mentioning that um, I can never pronounce this, that the Torbion. Did I pronounce that right? Correct. Yeah. How many, if you had 100 people that came into your, you know, to look at a watch, how many people just go, I like the look of that, I'll take it, or how many people, and then how many people actually go, talk to me about the movement, you know? That's interesting. Um, in some of my previous brands, in my, in my past life, movement was really important, super important. But I think when you start to work with brands that, are so enriched in connecting on a, I think a little bit more of a deeper level. Mm. It kind of changed that whole connect, you know, I guess the whole, certainly the whole selling. You know, I don't think I've ever been asked seven Friday what the movement is. Yeah. No, I, I've never experienced a customer in a retail store yeah. say, no, I won't buy it because it's not a Swiss movement. Mm. That's yeah. a really good brand image, you know. Because you're you're not selling it on what's internal, like it's what it's about. It's great. That's awesome and really refreshing to hear. It's it's a it's a bloody hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard, it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, because it it I th- it's a testament to the fact that the brand is mm. so strong as a lifestyle and yeah. so strong in its attitude. Mm-hmm. Because Seven Friday really is just it's an attitude towards life mm. and certainly into into product. Mm. You know, bright pink. Like really, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that that probably falls in line with the show me, don't tell me. Yeah, exactly right. You know, because don't, I, don't tell me what it is. I just like the look of it. I, I think we've all been, especially in the watch industry, we've always been told what what to buy, what is good quality, what is God. Look, look at the Rolex. Okay, so the Rolex screw down crown, which became you know water waterproof or you know um, water resistant, that was all about. Rolex developing something that was above everyone else mm. that became the standard but wasn't 100% necessary. Mm. So we were always told through marketing, you know, through through uh, through influencers, we were always told what we need to purchase and what the standard is and, and what, um, I guess, what is acceptable. But I think certainly the brands that I work with and, and, and absolutely with Seven Friday, it's – you wear it because you like it. Mm. You like the design. You like the brand attitude. You like everything about it. Um, you like the fact that you're probably going to have a whiskey with the owner one day. Like, it's not about what's inside. Mm. Absolutely not. And I think even, I think even uh, if you read a little bit about um, movements, so watch movements from Etta, uh, which are the one of the largest movement suppliers, mm-hmm. and watch movements from say Seiko or Miyota. So NH from from Seiko and the Miyota movements, they will, Etta will has even stated that the accuracy difference and the quality difference is minimal. Mm. And if you're, I think if you are, if you are anchoring your entire brand ideals on something that's inside that happens to be you know Swiss made or German made, you know and don't get me wrong, those those qualities are fantastic. Mm-hmm. But if that's all you're anchoring your brand on, you're going to have some issues. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Seven Friday 
when we when we launched seven years ago, Dan was very vocal about the whole Swiss made label. Mm. So I think he's even now, like you can go onto the back of the watch and you can see there's a little map of the world and it points to where all of our our parts come from. We movements from Japan, designers in in Zurich in our in our HQ and assembly and QC are in Hong Kong and China. And it's it's that transparency that I think people agree with. I think they 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 don't want to be bullshitted to anymore. Mm-hmm. And there's there's no more of that marketing to say Swiss made is, you know, the best. Yeah. Because I can tell you that there's a lot of brands in the Swiss market that are not one hundred percent Swiss made. And if you if you me as a customer, if I'm going out and I'm buying something that says Swiss made, I want it made in Switzerland. Mm. I don't want it to be supplied from Asia and cased and maybe final QC in Switzerland. I want it to be Swiss. Mm. So I think there's there's a, there's a lot to be said. And then there's a few brands that have been really vocal about it. Seven Friday, absolutely. Another brand, Moza, they've been really vocal about it as well to say, if you're buying Swiss, it should be Swiss, mm. plain and simple. Yep. So we don't, we don't pretend to be Swiss mm. as, a, as a brand. We, we, you know, yes, we're, I pay bills in Swiss francs. Um, and our head office is in, in Zurich and design is done in Zurich, but we're not a Swiss brand. Mm. Not at all. All right. Fair play. Do you get that in the automotive industry in, in your world? Like do people just buy the car or do they buy the mechanics? Do they buy the engine? Well, for like, brands like Ferrari, they buy the whole sort of lifestyle as well. Um, much like seven Friday, but it is, you know, that racing pedigree, Formula One heroes, automotive artisans or autom- like definers of the automotive history. You know, you're not just buying a Ferrari because it's red. You're buying it because it's just, you know, it's got a massive history, you know, success. It, it, it blasts out so many different sort of things. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Fair play. Fair play. Hmm. Very good. So what's next for you? So you say you're launching the Sniper. So we'll, um, we're not going to take it on as a full brand. We're just mm-hmm. going to sort of run through these last pieces. Mm-hmm. So it'll be, it won't be a, a launch. I think they'll, they'll be gone before we even get a chance to talk about them. Mm-hmm. Um, what's next for us? Hopefully our own space, our own Seven Friday space is definitely on the cards. We're just – Would it be in Sydney or Melbourne? Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. Nice. I'd nice. love to do Perth, but it's too damn far away. Yeah. Um, so it'd be, I'd say Sydney, Melbourne mm-hmm. will have to be first. Yep. Um, if the, if the right, uh, I get certainly if the right opportunity comes along, we could roll them out fairly quickly. Yeah. So hopefully we'll have our own little coffee slash whiskey slash cigar slash watch slash motorbike bar. The seven Friday wow. man cave. <laughs> yeah. Sign me up for all of it. Yep. Newsletters, tick, everything. Done. <laughs> and, and I saw those, um, those kind of blow up. They blow up chairs on your, oh, on, your yeah. on your Instagram feed. So it's a it's a little brand that uh, it's um, made in designer made in France, uh, and it's a brand called Mojau, and it is that sounds very French. Come on. It doesn't really. I was no, that, that was no no. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you just throw me there? Yeah. <laughs> it's um, but yeah, there it's inflatable furniture. Um, so, but the, I think the, the cool thing about for it. For the drunk person coming home, that's what that's for. <laughs> <laughs> I've had too much wine. <laughs> it, uh, the one of, I think really cool stuff about it, one, it packs down really well. So it's easy to ship around the world, which is a consideration <laughs> for us. But it, um, it, because it's uh, made from a, a semi-transparent, you can fill it full of shit. Not. Literally. But you can <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> <laughs> you can fill it full of anything you like. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's parts inside, like there's a section inside that is, um, I guess, uh, encapsulated by the rest of the inflatable parts. Okay. So you can put in, you can put in, you know, M&Ms, you can yeah. put in whatever, whatever yeah. you like. So I've seen feathers, I've seen, um, you know, like uh, leaves. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's quite a, quite a, f- a quirky little brand. Yeah. But really beautifully made, yeah. and and for like we're not talking inflatable pool toys kind of stuff. Yeah. It's um it's 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 incredible, um, almost like artistic design. Yeah. yeah. So like you know, sort of leaning on the Le Cabassier kind of design. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's it's super cool product. Um. So we do that in Hong Kong, and we sort of just started to dabble in it down here. Um, would look nice in here actually. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> John. <laughs> yeah. 
we'll have a few for the studio. How about that? Yeah, sounds good. So we're going to do coffee shops. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I think it's my hospitality side. Yeah. But that's the you know that's the thing, and we were chatting about this earlier that it's about about being hospitable, mm. and we really want to welcome people and bring people into the world of Seven Friday yeah. or anything else that we're doing. So we're a better place to do that. Yeah. Than in a cafe. Yeah, hundred percent. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Well. Nicholas, thank you very much for joining us this morning on Lifestyle Pirates. Thank you for having me. Um, awesome to see uh, some of the pieces, not only on the wrist. I keep looking at that one. <laughs> I do like the fluoro. Did you bring an invoice? <laughs> <laughs> um, how can people get in contact? What's your Instagram handle? Have you got a Facebook page or that kind of stuff? How can people learn more about not only Seven Friday but maybe you know Madden Associates as well? Yeah, so of course um, you can just search Mad Associates uh, across any of the platforms and it's going to pop up with either – uh, Sydney, Hong Kong, Shanghai, or France. Um, so we're a group of companies all headed up individually, mm -hmm. but we all sort of share, share that same voice. Mm -hmm. And, of course, every one of the brands have, then have their own their voice as well. So 7 Friday Australia is um, definitely the place to see everything that's going on there. Yep. And, uh, and we also have, of course, our own retail website, independentcollective.com.au. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the Save My Bush hat. Mm. Good luck on uh, generating some cash for the uh, the community there. And uh, thanks for telling the 7 Friday story. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers, guys. See you next week. Hooray. Yeah.